Hey, welcome back to the show. I'm Dan Sheen, or as we say in Krakoan, mecha like a high, mecha hiney ho. You know, uh, last time we talked about X-Men books, I reviewed three. This week, five X-Men books came out. Uh, we're going to talk about them, but as you might be able to tell from the background, everything is not peachy keen in the flower fields of Krakoa. So today, we're going to talk about the books that came out this week. Marauders number four, Excalibur number four. New Mutants number four, and X-Force number four. That's four number fours. But wait, I said five? That's right. Also Fallen Angels number four, but I didn't buy it, and I'm not going to review it because life is too short to read bad comics. So uh, let's talk about the other four today on Comic Book News. <laughs> hey, welcome back to the show. I'm Dan Shaheen. Great to see you. Man, what a big week for comics. There was a, just huge shipments of stuff that came out. Of course, it's the week before Christmas. That shouldn't surprise anybody. It happens all the time. Um, so there were five X-Men books today, like I said in my little intro, but we're only reviewing four today. Alas, you know, you got to be good to make the cut. And unfortunately, I think one or maybe more of to this week's books might not make the cut for the next issue. Let's uh, talk about them a little bit. First, we're going to talk about Marauders by Jerry Duggan, art by uh, uh, Lucas Wernick. Then we're going to talk about Excalibur number four. Teeny Howard wrote it. And um, Mark Costo is the artist, and Eric Arseniega is the colorist. Uh, then we'll talk about New Mutants number four, and with Ed Brisson writing, and Marco Faya, and Carlos Lopez on art chores. And finally, we'll end with uh, X-Force number four, right? So, man, that's a lot to cover, so uh, we better spend some time in the Million Dollar Comics camp. <laughs> hey, welcome to the Million Dollar Comics camp. Guys, I'm a little under the weather, you can probably tell this week, so I'm going to take this mellow we're gonna go through these four books i'm not gonna go probably through every page but i'll go through some of the highlights and lowlights of this week's four books so marauders excalibur new mutants and finally x-force let's take them in order and we'll start with uh, marauders number four uh this book a lot of people have been liking this is the book this is kitty pride's book right this is kitty pride is now a member of the new Hellfire Club. I guess she's the Red Queen of the Hellfire Club. What does that mean? It means she's on a boat. She's got a bunch of mutants helping her. Uh, and they go to the various countries that do not accept um, trade with Krakoa. And they work out black market deals as well as freeing mutants from those uh, sinister places. One of the things that's been interesting that I have not really touched on much in... Uh, in my Marauders reviews are these text pieces coming from who? We don't know who, but we know it's a government office coming from the X desk. We don't know who it's to or who it's from. Uh, you know, it, it, why would they bother blocking it out if it wasn't somebody we could know? From the tone and the, the way it's written, it seems maybe like a familiar character. I wanted to say my gut said Nick Fury, but I, I don't think this is like a lower level operative. So uh, my guess is Dum Dum Dugan. Let's see. We'll find out eventually if I'm right. If we stick along around that long. Anyway, uh, on to uh, uh, the Marauders, and they're heading out to uh, foreign countries and trying to free people, and they're getting held up by these guys, the Paragons, and I looked them up. And while I did find out about a group called the Paragons, I couldn't figure out who this specific guy was in here what his powers were, what he has to do. Sorry, I just don't know. We know that he's tough enough to take a lightning bolt and get up, but only a small lightning bolt because Storm then comes through with a bigger lightning bolt and just takes him out. Very anticlimactic. Uh, not too dramatic. Reminds me very much of Storm in the X-Men movies where she just kind of stands around and once in a while a lightning bolt uh, comes down. Uh, anyway, back to uh, Taipei with... Uh, Kitty Pride or Catherine Pride rather, and who the man she's asked to be her Red Bishop of the Hellfire Club, Bishop, right? Lucas Bishop. Uh, so they're on a mission and they're finding rich people 
Uh, they're, they're trying to save this Chinese guy who his wife is claimed was kidnapped by mutants. In reality, he's part of like a mutant worshiping cult. They find him and he's like so in heaven for them and he loves them and uh, wants to go with them. But then out come a couple of uh, kind of familiar looking Lady Deathstrike types, the big fingernails. Um, so this concerns Lucas a little bit, something we haven't seen before, Bishop, Lucas Bishop. Uh, but anyway, they're able to make short work of him and confront the the dude's wife who's sort of like making a lot of political hay out of all this anti-mutant hysteria which is usually the gameplay for these anti-mutant types and they basically show her up in front of everybody and say look it wasn't yeah it wasn't the mutants that kidnapped him you're wrong mutants are great uh here we get a little bit of conversation between uh hank pym and and bishop and and and, and uh Basically, uh, Bishop says to uh, to Hank, tells him about the Admanium, basically recaps what just happened. Again, these some of these text pieces, more valuable than others. Every once in a while, there's a little gem of a secret, but for the most part, I'm sorry, they're padding and filler. Um, we end with these guys who I'm not exactly sure who they are. Are they old Hellions or part of the old Hellfire Club? They don't get named here. Um, so much and and uh, we just know that there's something bad coming on the horizon right next uh, in Marauders Battleship uh, I'll be honest this book is okay it seems tied into the to the major continuity somewhat something weird going on with Kitty Pride not being able to go through the Krakoan gates and it has some other like anomalies that we still don't know about it's sort of a neat secret that's happening that hopefully will bear some fruit uh, this book, it's okay. Of the four books, uh, not my least favorite, not my favorite. Next, Excalibur. This book, I've heard a lot of people like him. And I think it's mostly because it's people that like the characters. From what, I, what I've been hearing, fans on the show, people in the comments, have been talking about, oh, I really love Rogue or I love Gambit, so hence I like Excalibur. I just feel like this is the most contrived of the books. They wanted to fit into this sort of fairy tale uh king arthur legendary stuff and they're kind of shoehorning stuff in there rogue is like a sleeping beauty and uh everybody hates mutants and gambit's got an attitude and uh uh britain you know in the midst of their own political stuff right now they're very anti-mutant um they are uh uh extremely uh anti the new captain britain because she's a mutant right they want their good old brian braddock back <laughs> meanwhile uh protesters getting rowdy whatever captain britain she's not having any of it and they talk about here about uh, how the law works in the uk basically other world is this other dimensional place that's where like merlin king arthur etc it sh shares a physical space i guess with the uk but is in another dimension and uh, the UK essentially views it as a line of defense for the UK. Captain Britain is the only one with um, any kind of, like, uh, uh, she's the boss when it comes to the other world. Anyway, we know Apocalypse has been involved from the very beginning of this book, has some kind of motives involving magic and mutants and whatever. That stuff has not become totally clear yet. Uh, we get introduced, or the character Richter who comes in here. By the way, not introduced except in the little character intros in the beginning. And you don't really know who this Like, you're supposed to just know who this is. I'm sorry. It's too generic. Anyway, he's a master of Earth, they call him. So maybe we're supposed to know that's Richter. But, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but Richter was like a master of vibrations, not like Earth control. He wasn't like an avalanche, per se. He was more like a vibe. Am I right or am I wrong? Let me know in the comments. Um, moving forward, uh, we get some stuff. Uh, oh yeah, we get this guy. We get this guy, Jamie Braddock, right? And he's hanging out in Krakoa and Toga. And I asked this before and I'll ask it again. You got thousands of mutants in your backlog to resurrect. You're going to resurrect the one with super mental instability and, uh, like Omega level reality warping powers. Doesn't seem smart to me. Um, and anyway, he proves that he's a jerk and he's still a sexist and a whatever and kind of a creep and a misogynist and what have you, whatever. 
So I just really question why you bring this guy back. Is he is he going to be anything but trouble? Are they going to subvert our expectations? Maybe he'll end up being the hero. Mm, that would be cool. We get a quick sneak peek at the family tree, the Braddock family tree. And now do we need all this space for this to see that James Braddock Sr. and uh, uh, Elizabeth Hartwood married. And they had James Braddock and they had the twins, Brian and Elizabeth. And Brian married Megan. And now they got Margaret. Uh, you know, again, filler. Oh, but we got a little Krakoan snuck in there. What does that say? Elizabeth Braddock. It says Elizabeth Braddock, Captain Britain. And uh, uh, James Braddock, it says Monarch. So is he the like the true, destined to be the true king? We'll find out. I'm sh pretty sure that's where this is going. Um, anyway, back to Richter. They're going into the Earth. They meet up with a bunch of Earth druids. And again, Richter has these sort of like tunneling powers, but like I don't remember that. Maybe his powers have changed like a lot of X-Men, but that is not the character that I remember. Um, so, but anyway, he looks up these, with these druids who are like, man, you're like us, you're of the earth, dude. You're one of us, one of us. And uh, he's almost kind of into it. He's sort of buying into it. Um, they're giving him these magic crystals that they're looking for. Uh, uh, they're, they're asking him to join the cult. And they're dressing him up in their robes and their raiments and what have you. For what reason, I don't know. But obviously, you know, they're trying to play up like he has some affinity for them and them for him. And then somehow, something goes on here. It's not really clear. The storytelling is not clear. The dialogue does not make it clear. But it seems like he says, F, F, my powers. And then trying to save Gambit from falling. But then Gambit falls. And he says, I didn't. I didn't mean to. What does that mean? Did his powers malfunction and he f caused Gambit to fail? Or did they not work and not save him? I don't quite understand it. The storytelling and art are the weakest in this issue that I've seen yet of the series. Uh, but I haven't given up hope yet. Um, back to Britain. Captain Britain is meeting with some of the sort of Britain snobs. Like these guys used to belong to Cult Akaba or still are part of a Cult Akaba who serve mutants. But kind of think they're better than mutants in reality. And uh, there's a lot of sneering here that like we want the real Captain Britain, not you. And... Uh, to her credit, Bretzi's not having any of that. She sticks up for herself. Um, more stuff about the family and that basically they've been letting this magic creep out from other worlds. Basically, when, when they made their return back to the world in this issue, a previous issue, they left the gate open and all these magical creatures are coming out into the UK and, and making people like fear other world. Okay. Um, and so, uh, now we're back and, and, and the creatures are coming through and they're coming, these creatures of, uh, of the night or what have you are invading Krakoa and rogues there and a box of Dr. Rogue <gasps> and she's awake after all. Oh my goodness. What's going on? Uh, next awaken rogue gonna come wake up and say something. Maybe she's literally just been laying around for four issues doing nothing. One of the coolest X-Men characters both in her powers, her history, uh, and her character. Talk about strong female characters from way back in Marvel. We love Rogue. We Check out uh, my review of Rogue's first appearance in uh, King Size Avengers Annual number 10, one of my favorite videos that I've done on back issues. Next, New Mutants number four. Uh, this one, um, Ed Brisson writing and we see the character same character we saw last time this is easily my least favorite this was a two issue fill in there's no other thing to call it i reviewed it last time and i said how i didn't like it and this one it gets even worse let's just quickly go into it boom boom i hate this character it's another character that just is she's cool because she and funny because she's a drunk she likes to get falling down drunk and blow things up and cause problems isn't that fun i guess i don't know um, anyway, back in uh, Nebraska, Pilgrim, Nebraska. If we remember last time, our folks got taken down by what? A power dampening mitt rocket launcher. One of the stupider things I've seen. And, and I talked about how that cheapened the idea of power dampeners. If you basically have this mutant kryptonite 
And it's so easy that these dudes in the middle of Nebraska can just get it and have these collars that they're putting on all the kids and all the mutants. It really doesn't make sense. This guy, this character is so confusing to me. I cannot tell if it's bad coloring or if he's actually supposed to be purple. He's not supposed to be a mutant from what I can tell. But as we'll see throughout this book, he looks really purple. And, you know, he reveals the plot, their whole thing, which is one of the stupider things I've seen. They're stopping the mutants because they live in a country, basically, where a pharmaceutical company, they were dying of this terrible disease caused by pollution from big corporations. And then another big corporation came around with a cure, but dicked around with them and dickered with them over the price till many tens of thousands more died. So they don't trust anybody. So when the X-Men come offering these flowers, they don't trust them. So this guy's like, what I want to do is I want to get... I'm going to kidnap some mutants. I'm going to ask for a bunch of the medicine. And then I'm going to sell it back to my own people for a profit. So he's not a hero in any way. Where he's able, a rebel from this weird small South American country gets this power draining tech is not made clear at all. Why he's purple makes no sense. What's up with his stupid beard coloration and and general coloration? Hopefully it's explained. Like they said, everybody was poisoned there. Maybe it's poisoning from the from his country but they don't talk about it this is just one of the stupider looking design characters i've seen in a long time especially for just a plain human anyway their whole plan is like look oh, we're gonna send armor you're gonna we're gonna send you back to the x-men but man don't you bring any telepaths and don't bring wolverine and don't bring anybody that might mess with us like what the it makes no sense whatsoever charles xavier from Krakoa or any of the telepaths could just stop these guys instantaneously. It does not make sense. This is, I'm going to say it, it's bad writing. It's bad art. It's bad writing. This is a bad comic. I was enjoying New Mutants. They did not need to put out four issues of it this quickly. They need to slow down and increase the quality and turn down the quantity a little bit on these X-Men books. Or I'm going to be out. And I have a feeling others are not going to be far behind me. So anyway... Boom Boom's got to go to Nebraska. There's no direct gate to Nebraska. I don't understand what that even means. Um, meanwhile, they're all kidnapped uh, and held hostage by these idiots. And somehow, they're, they're such idiots that they're able to convince him to take off her collar so she can feed her kids by like dissolving their food with her puke powers. But then... Who doesn't see this coming? She's going to use her puke powers and free these other freaks who come in and have mental powers and take over this guy. And boom, he got... I mean, come on. The fact that these guys were even able to subdue all of these X-Men is rather ridiculous. And um, I'm just glad they don't let this farce go any further you know, than it has. So they're mentally controlling these guys. Or they're cowardly weaklings. Everything's going down. When who should show up? But our favorite drunk hero, Boom Boom, uh, there was, uh, that's it. Uh, until next time, when, uh, what is it next time? Oh, Commando. Next time, Commando. Okay, fourth and final review for this week is X-Force number four. Um, I'd say this was, uh, maybe this was my favorite of the books, Mostly just because it actually sort of ties in to the main X-Men story the most, no doubt about it, right? This was the book where Charles Xavier was killed, I guess, and resurrected, I guess. I didn't mention that. I kind of have a theory that maybe they could not actually resurrect Charles and they've resurrected somebody else's mind into his body just to have a figurehead. Wouldn't that be a neat secret? I haven't heard anybody talk about that possibility. I think it could be. Anyway, this one, man, who's not in this book? Everybody's in this book. So let's go through it. X-Force 4 Blood Economics. Um, another attack on Krakoa by another group, this time via the ocean instead of the sky. These guys are able to penetrate the defenses again and whoop some ass and beat up a bunch of Madrox clones. Right? Madrox the multiple man. They got his clones. They're putting them to good use. Um, garden. But of course the main clone is alive. Uh, the main Madrox is alive, so everything's cool. But even if he wasn't, it would still be cool, right? Because they can just resurrect anybody they want. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. This is not great storytelling. Um, anyway, back to the Grove in Krakoa. Uh, and some analogy about Hercules that, frankly, I kind of was lost on me a little bit. Um, uh, 
but but the X-Force are coming in, or they're not, they, they just got dubbed the X-Force kind of last week. They are the mutant security force of the nation of Krakoa. Um, and that's what they are, right? They're like the CIA of, of, of the X-Men is how they get described in this book. And anyway, we're able to see uh, what? Uh, they're, um, oh yeah, these just as Jean Grey replaying the assassination of Madrox in their minds so they can sort of get a look at what's going on. And these guys use different kinds of weapons than the guys that attacked. So beasts, like they use a different caliber of weapon. So that means maybe it's not them, but maybe it's it's the same group that attacked us before. Those other guys had all this high tech stuff. These guys just have guns. Um. So. Uh. They attack. They don't. They don't know much. We get to see uh, inside Sage in the mutant headquarters. And oh, what does this say? A little bit of extra Craig Cohen that says, "Ooh, classified." Do not share with humans. Pretty sure they got this idea from my set uh, here on these Dawn of X videos. Uh, you might notice some cocoa up along uh, uh, the roof line of our, our X Men lab. So, anybody who comes through with some translations of those in the comments, ooh, you get extra credit. Um, speaking of extra credit, the text pieces. This one I found funnier more than anything. It's basically talking about how Charles Xavier has had been building up this portfolio of companies and wealth all his life leading towards Krakoa, right? His whole plan has been this all along. All the stuff we've seen in the Marvel Universe with the X-Men, it was all leading to this. In the back of his mind, at least that's what we're supposed to think. So he's had all these companies, and they had some fun with the company names. I like them. Xavier Pharmaceuticals, Gifted Mind Technologies, Uncanny Val Valley Farms, Summers News and Media, Evolution Energy, x Marks, Spot Mining, Cerebral Films, Phoenix Law Offices, Salem Center Auctions, and real estate, Blackbird Motors, Wolverine Waste Management, really? And his dream philanthropic foundation. And so with all these things, it wasn't just about making money, but about having key industries in the media and technology and just to give them what they're going to need for Krakoa. Um, oh, and then he's also the creator of the digital currency known as the X-Coin. X-Coin. Nice. Um... Back to Krakoa, and they're talking about, uh, you know, uh, they're talking about the assassination and how we've got to be worried about that. We got to protect Charles Xavier, just like we would protect you, Sebastian Shaw. And they're able to look and talk about some of their enemies that we've been seeing in the books. This guy with the peacock mask and these groups. They've got these manufactured soldiers that they're making, and uh, this is shaping up to be the major X Force uh, enemy. This is where they talk about how X, what the X-Force is and how it's going to be the CIA of the X-Men. And they talk about the political ramifications about that, about how the CIA didn't always have a, a moral compass on the stuff that they were doing and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and Nightcrawler's like, hopefully we will. Yeah, right. Uh, meanwhile, back to, For back to the armory and Forge. And um, uh, Forge is showing off some of his new biomechanical stuff. There's a bunch of macho homoerotic stuff with Wolverine and Forge, who uh, Forge calls Wolverine short stack. Is that new? I don't really remember that. Uh, anyway, she's he's, he's built some stuff for him, including uh, this crazy hand thing, where he's like, oh, it morphs to your hand, it grabs to your nerves, it shoots rockets, it never runs out of ammo as long as you water it and feed it every night. Uh, it's got swords on it, and it can just, and he says, he literally says it's versatile, it's really anything you want it to be. I think this is almost like a metaphor for like what this whole X Men Krakoa thing. Is. They just want it. it. It's everything, right? Every feature is there. That's a kind of a Hickmanism. He throws a lot at the wall. Um. Anyway, uh, obviously he's not a fan of Kid Omega, who's like, "Oh, I'm already a weapon. I have. I need no accessories." And he's like, "All right, great. Next." Uh. He says, "Oh, I've got a." pool of admantium for when we need to pull you back together wolverine which is sort of like a point we brought up way back when if that wolverine died in outer space and they're able to clone his body how'd they get his admantium back they thought about it or at least enough people complained about it that now they've 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 got a solution here and wolverine got an idea he's like oh this gives me an idea i don't suppose you can make me and we don't get to hear it um anyway they got to go off and attack and and um 
in here in Forge's Daily Planner where he talks about all the stuff he wants to build and all the squats and push-ups he wants to do. At the end, Shortstack has requested I build him blank. The question is, should I? The question is, how long should I make him wait just to annoy him? Oh, the question isn't, should I? The question is, how long should I wait? So what is that? I build him what? Wings? A tail? Foot claws? I don't know. Could be anything. Um, anyway, now we're back to uh, um, one of Charles Xavier's businesses is getting attacked by these terrorist dudes. And so now it's like, no, these aren't these are humans now that are, are at risk. We can't resurrect them. This is there's some stakes going on here. At least they acknowledge that. Like you can send in the X Men now, and here we get another cliffhanger death of Wolverine and and Quentin Quire, right? Like the. This is the end. They try to dive through the gate. They blow up the gate midway through, and I guess it cuts Wolverine in half. Is he dead? You know, normally we'd be like, oh, his healing power will save him. But now, Quentin Quire is obviously dead if that's his head rolled off. But now it's like, who cares? We know they're resurrectable, even if they can't recover the bodies, right? They have clones. They have got all they need to resurrect these. So there's no death drama. How many times can you milk a cliffhanger death where we know there are no stakes? This is already old news and doesn't work. I'm sorry, guys. Um, anyway, uh, next time, half measures, half measures. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for, for checking out my X-Men videos. I know I consolidated them all, and I know I'm not going to do Fallen Angels number four. Now, this is the last one. I did them all in order here. Fallen Angels number four is going to be the last one. And this is the first of the new X-Books that I just plain didn't buy because I don't like buying comics I don't like reading. Did I miss anything? Let me know if you read this one and there's anything at all key in the plot. From the cover, it looks like it ties in a little bit to some of these things that we're seeing now. But man, the connective thread has been so loose between all these books. I feel like I could get away with probably reading X-Men and X-Force. And that's about it. Maybe dip into New Mutants once in a while. Um, I'm, for now, I'm going to stick with these books and we'll see. As long as you guys keep watching and keep commenting, keep liking, uh, I'll keep reviewing them. Um, and that reminds me, hey... Thank you for subscribing, man. We rocketed past 500 and we're up to 511 or something like that subscribers now. If you haven't already, please take a moment and click that subscribe button. We are on a quest to get to 1,000 subscribers. That is the minimum for monetization at YouTube. And boy, oh boy, once we get monetized, we get to upgrade to the trillion dollar comics cam. We get to increase our comics budget. We get to increase our pre and post production budgets on comic book news. And uh, the one I've got to thank for all of that it's you. It's you guys out there who are watching these videos, uh, who are engaging in the comments, who are sharing these with your friends and spreading the love of comic book news. I really appreciate it. I'm trying to make a show that's a little bit different from some of the other comic book shows. I, I love watching comic book reviews on YouTube. I think there's a lot of great channels out there. I'm trying to do something a little bit different with the production values, I'm trying to support physical comics and comic shops, I'm trying to do long form interviews and in-depth stuff when I can. And lots and lots of comic reviews in between uh, when I can't. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, thank you for subscribing, and we will see you next time.